Well, you obviously had uh, a plan to take the overall story of the Eighth Doctor and and obviously pay it forward because obviously that was your new Doctor. There was yes. no, nothing else around to yes. just sort of go against it. Yes. And you thought at that time the show probably wasn't coming back. Absolutely, I mean, never imagined the show would ever come back. So yes, with the Eighth Doctor, we could we could do these ongoing things with the Divergent Universe. I had an end point in mind for the Divergent Universe. He wasn't going to stay in there forever. Um, but it was going to go on significantly longer than it did. Um, but then when the show was announced it was coming back, Jason said to me, actually, you know what? I don't think we should do the Divergent art because if we're going to start picking up new people to Big Finish because the show's coming back, I don't want to have something that is inaccessible because they're suddenly going to feel they've got to buy the last 20 stories because it's all set inside the Divergent Universe. And it was the only time in the whole nine years of Big Finish where Jason said to me, I'm asking you, could you bring that to an end? And I had no hesitation. The moment he asked me that, I went, yep, fine, sorted. So we did, literally, boom, cut that dead, brought the, did the next life, wrapped it all up, and all I did was take some of the stories that would have been Divergent Universe stories mm. and just release them normally. Now, if I remember correctly, that Terra Firma came, didn't it? That was the story where... Ter Terra Firma was a story that... I, I always... I just said, I always knew there was an end yeah. to the... And, and that final scene of the next life, of them walking through, opening a big door, going, where are we? Open the door, and 10,000 Daleks turn around and go, rah, 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 and Davros says, welcome home, Doctor, yeah. was in my head when we wrote Zagreus. I knew that that was... Ultimately, in four years' time, that was where we were going to end up. As it is, we ended up there two years later. But that was always there. So terra firma, in the sense of a Dalek story with Davros and the Eighth Doctor, in that incident, that's that was there. That story. Right from I mean, go. a lot of the stories, um, I can I can honestly say that a lot of the stories I can remember and, and thoroughly enjoyed. Ninety five percent of every single big finish I probably enjoyed. But that one stays with me because it's the one where Davros wins. Mm. And of, of all the characters, the Master, Davros, a, a few of them, none of them really sort of have the intellectual heft to really beat the Doctor. Well, but that was just an amazing moment. It's because Davros is, uh, Davros is an... In I'm not going to go into the no, crazy, no, but he's an interesting character because he's not... Strictly speaking, he's not a villain. I never, I never wanted to portray him as a villain. If you look at what I'd done with him in the Davros story, release number forty-nine, um, I deliberately Lance and I had worked out not to portray him as a villain. He's a totally amoral, but that whole origin story of him and everything was was, was there to show him as a real three D person. Ditto when we did Juggernauts. He's a smart, intelligent man, and he works out this brilliant plan with the mechanoids and the, 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 the managing to convince Mel that he's just a man in a wheelchair. That he's a very intelligent character, in a way that I generally don't find the Master particularly thrilling and intelligent. And I think what Joe did in his Master story was brilliant, but you can only do that once. Uh, the Master isn't a character who I ever sat down and went, oh, I wish we could have every week in Doctor Who. Davros I would happily play with quite a lot. But both of them really... Are completely psychotic, aren't they? No, 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 no. no. I don't, see I don't think either of them is psychotic at all. Really? I think that I think they are both. I think the master is, or a sociopath at least. Yes, I, I, the master is definitely a sociopath, absolutely, and is very driven, and he's driven by some demons that, as Russell has exploited enormously, and I think made a lot of sense to the master. But in those days when we didn't know that, he w he was someone I couldn't really relate to because I just thought he's a bit pantomime and a bit dull because all the Master wants to do is rule the universe, do this, do that, and he's going to get defeated because he's an idiot. And the Master I never thought was particularly smart. Davros is a smart man, he's a scientist, he's clever, he's ambitious. Every single story is on I mean, Resurrection is a bit different because it was rescuing, but Revelation of the Daleks, when he's being the great healer, that's the smartest thing in the world. How do I set up a new Dalek army? I know. I'll go and set up a farm for dead people, and everyone will love me, and I'm called the great healer, and they'll all think I'm this marvellous egalitarian person, and they'll give me all their dead bodies, all their dying people, I'm going to turn them all into Daleks. That's a fantastically clever scheme. And that's what I loved about Davros, and that's why I love Jack and Knott's, that's why I love Davros, and that's why I love Terra Firma. He is portrayed as an intelligent, scheming, clever person. His morality is 
utterly questionable and utterly wrong and repugnant and everything we see as villainous. But villainy, true villainy only works in fiction when the guy being the villain is completely and utterly believable within his own sphere. That he knows what he's doing, which is where the master falls down because the master's an idiot. Davros isn't Davros. The moment you portray Davros as an idiot, You've, you're not portraying Davros. I think Davros is one of the best creations in the history of Doctor Who as a villain. He's, he does he's seem to have motives, doesn't he? That's the thing. Total motives. Uh, quite often, Driven, the he knows motives what he's doing. Are, well, what, yeah. not there. What are they? Why, why are you? Why are you, why are you dressed as a scarecrow for Christ's sake, <laughs> Anthony? What's that all about? No, Davros. I, I'm passionate about Davros more than I'm done. It's Daleks. I like, but they don't really press my buttons. That's more of a Nick thing. Davros, I, I think, is a really interesting character and that's why I loved working with Lance on the Davros story because he got he we shared that and I didn't know that at the time I went to Lance to write Davros because he's such a good writer but I hadn't twigged that we both were really coming on that on the same viewpoint and and I will also say that on audio a lot of it is to do with Terry Malloy's performance because he is, brilliant, he is magnificent brilliant. as Davros he really is and that's not take anything away from Michael Wisher or David Goodison or Julian because they're all brilliant as well. Michael is amazing. Julian was fantastic. But Terry on audio, mm, he he played Davro. He understood. It's like Terry had sat down and, and, I mean, he and I have discussed it. When we did the I, Davros miniseries, he and I had a lot of discussions about it. And again, we were on the same wavelength that you can't successfully portray a good villain if you don't think the villain's three-dimensional, if you don't understand his desires and his ambitions which is when the master goes wrong because he's a very two-dimensional pantomime villain and you can't you can't retrospectively go ah well we'll give him that background we'll make him this this and this well you didn't need to go davros davros was there right from genesis yeah. of the daleks that 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 was especially there. that moment with you know for tiniest pressure of yes i have to put yes. the glass yeah. that tells you everything you need to know about mm. him in one line yeah superb stuff and you, you've, so you've taken that, you've moved with Davros. Are there any other characters you were really proud to have worked on? I always wanted to do the Celestial Toymaker. Originally we, we tried to get the, we, we got the rights to the Celestial Toymaker with no problem, but I couldn't get Michael Goff. And so I scrapped the idea because I didn't want to recast. Um, maybe that was a mistake. They recast later on very successfully with David Bailey and that was fantastic. I didn't want to recast, so I let the Toymaker go. The Toymaker is another interesting character. I, I, I wrote a book about the Celestial Divided Toymaker. Divided loyalties, yeah. And there's a reason for that, which is that I think he's an interesting character. He's got so much there, and I wanted to exploit that in the book, and I wanted to exploit that more on audio, um, but we I never did it, and, and I'd better say Big Finish have done it, I think, once, maybe even twice now, mm. uh, with, with David playing the Toymaker, and it's brilliant. But, but I really wanted... Originally, my trilogy was going to be Toymaker, Omega Master, the Greyos. Um but we couldn't get the toy maker. I couldn't get Michael, so I said to Nev, "If you can't do uh, toy maker, do you fancy doing Omega?" And he then created this, the best thing you could have done with Omega, which is which is which is that story which I love. And you see, I was talking earlier about using audio as a medium. Mm. How brilliant is that? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to blow it for anyone that hasn't listened to it, but I don't care uh, because you should have listened to it by now. But you have the Doctor in it for three episodes. Yeah. And because it's audio and it's Peter Davison, you assume it's the Doctor. And then at the end of episode three, the TARDIS arrives, the Doctor walks out and goes, what's going on here? And you're going, oh my God, that wasn't the Doctor. That's where audio is brilliant. There's another example of that very early on in Whispers of Terror, where there is a character who's in it all the way through, but he isn't, he doesn't exist. He's in somebody's imagination. And it's only when you realise that towards the end and, and the blind guy goes, uh, but what about such and such? And you went, you who there's no one else in this room and because he's blind you suddenly realize that all the conversations that he's been having with this other character when other people have been in the room they never interacted but you don't get that on the first listen it's only when you know it you go oh, that's brilliant justin's writing is clever and nev did exactly the, the same thing with the Omega. audio version of the sixth sense in many in many ways or the hour yes the i suppose yeah. so i mean the sixth sense came after much later both of those yeah, i think yeah, yeah. um but yeah, I mean, it's a clever trick. It's a very, very clever trick. I have to say, I, I do think The Sixth Sense is one of the best movies ever made. I love it. I Me do. Yeah. Uh, Shemalian's, when he's, when he, when he's a fan all cylinders, 
he's a brilliant director that and and the village i think are fantastic unfortunately he also did unbreakable and that terrible you don't like unbreakable i don't like unbreakable go and stand in the corner no i don't like unbreakable because it's so dull and predictable really yeah i could see it coming from a mile off which i never did the first time i saw the sixth sense i didn't see it coming uh, the village I did see coming uh, the moment the village started I was with my other half and I turned around and went oh, this is set modern day they're going to run out the village and it's all going to be modern day outside and he went shut up because it hadn't occurred to him and but it you know it but didn't alter the fact it's a great movie ironically enough, I the saw it happened to me with um, with Sixth Sense I worked it a very early oh, on I, see, I wish I had I wish I was clever enough to have done that but I didn't but then when you but watch it with Unbreakable you see that's the thing oh no I see Unbreakable I, was, I think probably I was looking really looking for for tricks in Unbreakable I thought he's going to be tricksy in this and there's so many tricks going on it I just think it's a mess of a movie yeah. uh, whereas I love The Village and then I hated that awful awful one he did with Mel Gibson is it Signs God, that's a terrible film. Signs? Signs. Oh, I love that. Terrible film. Oh, 